ever had the feeling that you were being followed? That somebody's eyes were on you, but you just weren't sure where the eyes were? That you weren't quite alone when you thought you were or felt that you were in imminent danger? Ever felt that, well, something wasn't quite right? 99% of the time, these feelings are just feelings. Maybe we were tired or a bit worse for wear after a late night out. Normally, it is just our brain tricking us into paranoia because we're conditioned to be cautious of the dark. But there have been cases where people's gut feelings have been right. And just like that, they have vanished without a trace. There are disappearances that have not been solved to this day. Even the most seasoned investigators in the best police departments simply can't work out what has happened or where a person has gone. It is like they have, quite literally, disappeared into thin air. The Unexplained Disappearance of Kenny Veach Kenny Veach was a 47-year-old avid hiker of the Mojave Desert in Nevada. On November 10, 2014, he told his family he planned to go on a two-day hike in the mountains and look for a cave. He never returned. Veach was an experienced hiker who often took solo trips to explore the Mojave and Great Basin deserts of Nevada and California respectively. He was a minimalist or ultralight hiker. Even though he would camp out for days at a time, he only ever brought the bare minimum of supplies. He rarely brought a GPS, compass or map. Although he had successfully completed many hikes in his lifetime in that manner, it is still an incredibly reckless way to hike. Veach had a YouTube channel under the name Snakebit McGee, where he had uploaded a few videos but mostly used it to watch and comment on others. His channel name came from his tendency to pick up snakes whenever he found them. He was bitten by a rattlesnake, which is where his tag name came from. On June 2014, he commented on a video titled Son of an Area 51 Technician. In his comment, he stated that he had found an M-shaped cave about seven miles out from Nellis Air Force Base in the Sheep Mountains, which are north of Las Vegas, Nevada. He explained that he was an experienced hiker who regularly found abandoned mine shafts and explored them, picked up rattlesnakes for fun, solo hiked across mountains, other would fear to go, and even came close to Area 51. Despite all this, he never went into the M cave. He claimed that as he began to enter the hidden cave, his entire body began to vibrate. The further in he went, the worse the shaking became. He suddenly grew very scared and quickly ran out of the cave and hiked back to his car. His comment sparked an interest with others who encouraged Beach to go out and discover the cave again, this time filming the entire hike. He agreed and left to find it a second time, carrying along with him a video camera and a 9mm handgun. He posted a video of his hike, but unfortunately was unable to find the mystery cave. The viewers criticised him and provoked him to go out a third time. On November 10th, 2014, he left for an overnight trip, but never came back. After two days and no return, his family contacted authorities who conducted a search. In the beginning of the video he had previously posted, he stood by an abandoned mine shaft while narrating his mission details. It was at that mine shaft that search and rescue found his cell phone, ten days after the search began. Over 30 search and rescue volunteers conducted three separate searches and a helicopter flyover to no avail. The trail went cold after that. Many conspiracy theories cropped up. Did he fall down the mine shaft, Or had he stumbled upon a hidden entrance to Area 51 and discovered a dangerous military secret? Was he just a reckless hiker who injured himself or did he reach the M cave and find something ominous inside? A woman claiming to be his girlfriend later posted a comment on his last video that stated she did not believe he had had an accident. She explained that he had been suffering from depression for some time and had quit his job the year prior, so she argued that he had most likely taken his own life. So far, no conclusion has yet to be drawn about Kenny Beach's mysterious disappearance. What do you think the truth is? On October 8, 1976, Teresa Lynn Gibson, also known as Trenny, went on a field trip to the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. 
She traveled with 35 to 40 of her classmates from Bearden High School in Knoxville, Tennessee. Despite being surrounded with a group and other hikers, 16-year-old Trenny mysteriously disappeared from the park. The field trip was odd to begin with. There were almost 40 students, yet only one teacher to supervise them, plus the bus driver. According to some students, they were not even informed of their field trip destination until they arrived at the park. Only then did they find out that they would be hiking about 1.8 miles from Klingman's Dome to Andrews Bald, and then returning to the Forney Ridge Trail. When students began their hike, they split up into smaller groups based on their walking speed. Throughout the day, Trenny walked at different paces with various groups of classmates. However, at some point in the afternoon, she mysteriously vanished. She was last seen by classmates near Klingman's Dome at 3 p.m. They were hiking along a fairly steep trail with thick vegetation and sudden drop-offs. Apparently, she glimpsed something on the right side of the trail and left the path. That was the last time anyone saw her. Rescue teams began searching for her in the late afternoon. The weather and fall foliage made it difficult for search and rescue to use helicopters and inspect the trail. Instead, they used tracking dogs to pick up her scent. There were around six teams of bloodhounds and German shepherds that searched and picked up her scent near the juncture of the Klingman's Dome Trail and the Appalachian Trail. They followed her scent past Klingman's Dome Tower up until a mile and a half from Newfound Gap. The scent then disappeared along the roadside. Multiple theories have arisen and suspects investigated. Some believe Trenny was in Klingman's Dome Observation Tower while the initial search was being conducted because it was never inspected. Once the searchers left, she travelled to the roadside where she got into a car, either voluntarily or against her will. There are some reports of cigarettes and beer cans found along the roadside. Trenny's classmate, Robert Simpson, was implicated as a suspect since her hairbrush was discovered in his car, but police quickly dismissed the idea. Trenny's parents, Robert and Hope Gibson, informed the police of a previous break-in by a young man whom Mrs. Gibson shot at. After being shot, he threatened to hurt their daughter. Although the authorities investigated this man, there were no leads for them to follow. Searches were conducted extensively through October and then again from April 18th to May 5th, 1977, but to no avail. Searches resumed in 1981 as well, but they never found anything. Kim Pouncey, a friend of Trenny's, gave an interview in November 2017 for an episode of Appalachian Unsolved where she expressed her doubt of an abduction. She believes Trenny left of her own accord and had someone waiting for her in the park, that she had planned it because she wanted to leave and get away. After so many searches, the rangers of the National Park were convinced that she was not in the park. Her body was never found. There are no current suspects, leads or evidence. It's strange that a young girl could vanish while on a popular trail in the middle of the day surrounded by people. Whether she orchestrated her own disappearance or was kidnapped will remain a mystery. Christy Lynn Vorak Christy Lynn Vorak was living with a foster family in 1982, when on Halloween of that year, she went missing. There was a reported sighting of her at a bus stop that evening in Seattle, Washington, but investigators were unable to confirm whether it was actually her. Vorak was a 13-year-old white female at the time of her disappearance. She was described as being 5'3 and 110 pounds, with brown hair and hazel eyes. In order to assist with finding her, age progression photographs were created to attempt to visualize what she might look at ages 29 and 43 if she was still alive. A distinguishing feature that was noted was the middle finger on her left hand, which was shorter than the rest as a result of a birth defect. Vorak's mother still believed her to be alive, although authorities were not convinced of this. It was believed instead that she may have been a victim of Gary Ridgway also known as Green River, although this too was never confirmed. This is thought to be questionable, as unlike Ridgway's other victims, she was younger and not known to be a runaway. The only evidence that may have linked Vorak to the Green River is that she apparently roamed around the streets of Tacoma, near the area where many other young women were taken advantage of and where many lives were taken. Vorak was added to the list of his victims in May of 1993. This case, like the first two, also remains unsolved. 
One can only hope that both Song and Vorak are somewhere safe and will be discovered eventually and return home to their families and friends. We can only hope that the perpetrators are discovered and brought to justice so that their families and friends can find resolution and peace. The Mystery of the Marlborough It is not uncommon for ships to be tossed to pieces at the mercy of violent storms brewing in the deep sea or spit onto unseen coral reefs and shredded by the underlying rocks. Occasionally, a ship will simply disappear and leave the family members of her crew to wonder at its fate. This appeared to be the case with the Marlborough, which was a large, iron merchant ship that went missing in 1890 after setting sail from New Zealand in January, on its way to bring wool and frozen meats to London. In those days, it took many months to make the treacherous passage across open seas. Occasionally, the ship would fall prey to the submerged icebergs hidden off the coast of Cape Horn, or some other dangerous hazard lurking in the open sea and would never be seen again. So, when the Marlborough still had not arrived at port in April, it was assumed lost at sea, not an uncommon fate for merchant ships at the time. However, the case became instantly more mysterious when the Marlborough turned up again 23 years later in 1913 off the coast of Cape Horn, with the skeletons of her crew scattered curiously all over her deck. The report of the sailors who found the remains of the ship reported that about 20 skeletons were found on board and in a lot of different locations. One was found alone, directly under the wheel, and another one found alone on the bridge, with five more nearby. No less than three skeletons were found by the ladder leading below the deck. The largest group found in a single area consisted of ten skeletons, in what is known as the mess room, the main social quarters of the ship. The most mysterious part of the discovery of what remains of the Marlborough was the placement of the skeletons. Because they were scattered throughout the ship, as though going through their normal operating routines, they must have all passed away abruptly from the same thing and all at the same time. The bodies in the hatchway suggest that they may have been running from something, although the other bodies throughout the ship rule out being rounded up by pirates and dying. Additionally, what was presumably the captain was found under the steering wheel, as though he passed away while trying to direct the ship, which would be an odd priority if your crewmates were losing their lives. Although the mystery of the Marlborough has riddled minds since its discovery in 1913, and the ship was thoroughly searched for clues at the time of its discovery, we will likely never know the circumstances that led to this unusual placement of bodies throughout the ship. George Pinker Yosemite National Park is famous for its amazing waterfalls, deep valleys, and ancient sycamore trees. Located in the Sierra Nevada Mountains in Central California, the park draws 4 million visitors every single year. On Friday, June 17, 2011, 80 people from a church in Hawthorne, California were visiting the park. 20 of them, including 30-year-old George Penker, decided to make the hike to Upper Yosemite Falls. The hike to Upper Yosemite Falls offers fantastic views on its way to the view of the tallest waterfall in the United States. The trail is somewhat strenuous, with a steep fall to one side. Although the trail is not the easiest, it is said the payoff at the top is worth it. Once at the top, the group disbanded to allow everyone a chance to explore and return to the trailhead at their leisure. Penker's friends assume he had taken the trail back down alone and therefore did not report him missing until 9pm. Penker was last seen wearing grey sweatpants with white stripes, a black t-shirt that says D and B, along with a blue cloth bag. Searches for Penker started almost immediately, with full-fledged searches beginning the following morning. In all, 105 people, a helicopter and six dogs were all involved in the search. Fellow churchgoers stated that Penker was in good spirits on the whole trail and seemed to make the hike without much trouble, though no one could pinpoint where they saw him last. The National Park Service website states the following about the trails. Do not stray off of the maintained path, as you will find steep drops adjacent to the trail. The upper half of the trail is steep and rocky, but the arduous climb is well worth the amazing views you will be rewarded with at the top.
it is easy to believe Penka found himself off the trail resulting in a quick fall to his assumed death. Due to the dangerous conditions and the lack of any evidence tied to Penka, searches were scaled back for the safety of those searching. Sadly, in all the years searching for Penka, not a shred of evidence has turned up, not a piece of clothing nor his blue bag. It is still widely believed Penka perished just off the trail, again proving that although beautiful, national parks can turn into death traps if you are not careful. Thousands of people have gone missing in national parks. Due to how vast they are, the majority of these individuals are never found. This has caused various people to put forward different theories to explain their disappearances. What's worrying is that this number seems to be on the increase, something that national park workers can't explain. Sadly, thousands of people are reported missing every single day. While the majority of missing person cases get resolved, there's still a large number of people that are never seen again. Lars Mittank Lars Mittank's last minutes may be captured in the most popular YouTube video featuring a missing person. Mittank's story begins in Golden Sands, Bulgaria on July 6, 2014. He had spent the week vacationing at the seaside resort with a group of friends. On this day, after arguing over soccer, Mitank got into an altercation with four men resulting in a ruptured eardrum and possible concussion. Due to the injury, a doctor advised him not to fly and prescribed him the antibiotic Cefiroxim before referring him to a hospital. Although his friends said they would stay with him, Mitank insisted that he was fine and they could return home without him. A friend later stated he seemed to be in a good mood when they left. His friends went on their way and Mitank checked himself into a cheap hotel, called Hotel Color. He was only on his own a day before his strange behavior was captured on the hotel's security cameras. The footage revealed him pacing the halls and hiding in an elevator. He quickly became paranoid, and in a panicked call home to his mother, he whispered that four men were coming to kill him. He then advised her to cancel his credit cards. CCTV last captured Mitank in Varna Airport. The video shows him entering the airport with his luggage before walking out of sight. Shortly after, Mitank is seen again, leaving his luggage behind. He is seen sprinting through the airport as if he is running for his life. He pushes through the doors of the airport and continues to run through the parking lot. The last shots of Mitank show him scaling a fence close to a wooded area. Airport doctor Kosta Kostkov later described Mitank as nervous and erratic. He claimed Mitank began to tremble when seeing a construction worker and was noted saying, I don't want to die here, I have to get out of here. His belongings, including a backpack and suitcase, were later recovered at the airport. Its contents revealed nothing about his disappearance, however. Mitank was never seen again. Ivona Visorek It was the 17th of July 2010 in Spot, Poland. In the early morning light, 19-year-old Ivona Visorek makes a final call to her friend Adria. Earlier that night, the girls were out celebrating their completion of high school, attending a party not far from their home. Adria convinced Ivona to leave and continue their partying at a nearby nightclub, Dream Club. Not long after midnight, they arrived at the club, along with three of Adria's male friends, Paul, Adrian and Mark. After an argument with the men, Ivona stormed out, determined to walk the almost four miles home. Texts from her phone indicate she was angry her friend did not follow her out of the club after the argument. There were several calls made to Adria. The last one occurred at around 4am, in which Adria had apologised for the incident at the club. Ivona confessed she wasn't in a state to be seen at home, still drunk from all the partying. Adria informed Ivona she would leave her keys outside of her apartment if she wanted to come to stay with her. CCTV easily tracked Ivona's path, having been seen on several different cameras. Barefoot and alone, she headed towards the neighbourhood that she and Adria lived in. Needless to say, Ivona never arrived. Later that day, after awakening and finding her keys where she had left them, Adria contacted Ivona's family to check that she had made it home. Although she was reported missing, 
Authorities claimed Ivona was capable enough to make it home and could have stayed at another friend's house. It was a week before the disappearance of Ivona was taken seriously. During the last few seconds of the video captured of Ivona, a man was seen walking behind her. He was possibly the last known person to see her alive. Even though his picture and sketches were widely circulated, no one ever stepped forward claiming to be the man. And he was never identified. In 2014, Adria and one of the men from the club were interviewed regarding the disappearance. Although both of them corroborated the time Ivona left the club, neither of them could maintain eye contact with the camera. And though they seemed to remember the time of her leaving, not one of them could remember what the argument was about. This strange behaviour has led some to believe that perhaps Adria and the men know more about her disappearance than they were telling. In Poland, Ivona's disappearance has not faded away. Some 12,000 pages on a forum remain active searching for Ivona, sharing pictures of her and asking for someone to step forward. Some fear she has been sold into human trafficking. Even with hundreds of people from the area interviewed, no sign of Ivona has ever turned up. The Carol A. Deering The Carol A. Deering was built in Maine in 1919. It was the last ship to be ever made by G.G. Deering Company, and it was designed to carry large amounts of coal. On August 22, 1920, the ship set sail to Rio de Janeiro with Captain William H. Merritt, his son Sewell, and a ten-man crew. A few days into the trip, Captain Merritt became very ill. They made a stop in Luz, Delaware, so the captain and his son could get off, and they were replaced with Captain Willis B. Wormel and Charles McClellan. They made their way to Brazil and delivered the coal without any problems. While in Brazil, Captain Wormel visited another captain and told him he didn't trust the crew on the Deering. He had many concerns with them, and he only trusted the engineer, Herbert Bates. When the ship reached Barbados, Captain Wormel spoke with yet another captain about how troubling his crew had been especially McClellan, who treated the rest of the crew badly. The captain he spoke with, along with two others, heard McClellan say that he would get Captain Wormel before they made it to Norfolk. While sailing through a storm off Cape Fear, the ship lost its anchors and chains. On January 29, 1921, the Deering came to the Cape Lookout lightship and tried to radio for help, but the radio at the lightship was out. Thomas Jacobson, the lightship's keeper, said someone tried using a megaphone since the radio was out, but the man had broken speech and didn't seem to act like an officer. He also said the crew was going around on the quarterdeck, where crewmen usually weren't allowed to be, and they also seemed confused. Two days later, C.P. Brady spotted the Deering from the Cape Hatteras Coast Guard Station. The ship was stuck with its sails still set on the edge of Diamond Shoals. Due to bad weather, rescue ships couldn't get near it until February the 4th. By the time the rescue crew got to the ship, it was taking on water and had been abandoned. Strangely, almost everything inside the Deering was damaged, but it didn't seem to have happened completely by accident. It appeared that the binnacle box had been forced open and broken with a sledgehammer found nearby. The ship was missing various things such as navigation equipment, life rafts and the crew's personal items. They also found food left on the stove leading them to believe they were preparing food at the time the ship was abandoned. The Deering was damaged beyond repair and was destroyed. The government launched an investigation to find out what happened, but no official conclusion could be made. The ship had been sailing away from any bad weather and there was no evidence of piracy. Many believed there may have been a mutiny, which would explain the man Thomas Jacobson saw trying to get help. They also considered the idea that when the ship got stuck, the crew got away on lifeboats and were swept out to sea. None of the crew was ever found, and neither was any wreckage or lifeboats. The story of Carol A. Deering is one of the most popular mysteries among sailors. It is now often referred to as the ghost ship of the Outer Banks. Many people have theories about what happened, but it is likely that no one will ever know the truth. Derek J. Luking don't try to follow me. Those are the final words of 24-year-old Derek J. Luking. Found scribbled on a note in Luking's abandoned car, it is the final piece of evidence in his strange disappearance. 
Liu Qing grew up in Virginia before moving to Knoxville, Tennessee, to attend college at Johnson University. After graduating, he took a job as an orderly at Peninsula Behavioral Health Center. Described by his roommate as having a servant heart, it raised a red flag when Liu Qing failed to show up for work on the morning of March 15, 2012. This uncharacteristic behavior caused Liu Qing's family to leave Virginia for Tennessee to look for him immediately. A quick search of his computer found searches for the nearby Smoky Mountain National Park as well as reservations for a hotel. The hotel, located in Cherokee, North Carolina, had footage of Liu Qing leaving his room on March 17th, two days after he failed to show up for work. Inside the hotel room, Liu Qing left a Bible and a bottle of alcohol. Determined to find him, Liu Qing's family set out to search the area for themselves. By accident, the family came upon Liu Qing's abandoned Ford Escape. The vehicle was in the newfound Gap parking area, located along the border of Tennessee and North Carolina. Contents of the vehicle seemed to suggest Liu Qing had plans of a long hike or even camping. With him, he had a pickaxe, compass, lamp, pocket knife, knife sharpener, tent, sleeping bag, 100 feet of black parachute cord, granola bars, and a survival belt containing a multi-tool, flashlight, and a fire starter. There were also pages from a military survival guide, along with his wallet still full of cash. The last clue was the note. Don't follow me. Some assume this was a sure sign that Liu Qing was planning on leaving and never returning. Liu Qing's father noted that his behavior had changed recently. Liu Qing began smoking and drinking. He complained about where he was in life and about being unsatisfied with his job. His family was firm, however, that Liu Qing was not depressed and would not kill himself. Ignoring the note's request, search and rescue teams began to search the woods in the newfound Gap area. Interviews with hikers in the area turned up nothing. Even though it was a beautiful day and the park was busy, no one remembered seeing Liu Qing. This led investigators to believe that Liu Qing had either avoided the crowds intentionally or left the trail almost as soon as he stepped foot on it. Trails in the area are well marked, but it is incredibly easy to get lost if someone ventures off of them. Search teams scoured the woods, looking for any sign of Liu Qing. There were no obvious signs of his presence. Many searches led to rhododendron thickets that he could not have passed through without obvious evidence of him being there. Some believe Liu Qing went missing while scouting the trail, fully intending to come back for his gear. Others think he planned to take his own life, but the purchase of nearly $1,000 in camping gear would prove frivolous if this was his intention all along. So what happened to Derek Liu Qing? Why did he have an arsenal of outdoor gear but didn't bring it with him onto the trails? Did he write the simple four-word note indicating he had no intention of returning? The search for Derek Liu Qing is not over. Despite years of searching, no sign of him has ever shown up. The 13-year-old's car discovery Griffin Lake in British Columbia, Canada is a deep blue expanse sitting below stunning mountains amid beautiful Canadian countryside. Snowy peaks stand majestically at the end of the lake, with the scenic retreat making a perfect countryside getaway location. But in 2019, Griffin Lake became the subject of a mysterious discovery, one that had evaded Canadian police for nearly 30 years. Max Warenka was a normal 13-year-old boy from Alberta, Canada. He enjoyed the outdoors and had spent time in the past filming his adventures with his GoPro camera. In August 2019, Warenka had been out paddleboarding on Griffin Lake when he spotted something strange lurking below the surface. A group of people who had been staying in cabins on the lake shore also came to have a look, and they deduced that they were seeing the shiny underside of a car. Bemused as to what a car could be doing at the bottom of the lake, Warenka and his family reported the discovery to the police. After doing some googling, the group realized that a group of four people had been rescued from a sunken vehicle in Griffin Lake in 2007, assuming that the car was simply left over from that. A pretty cool discovery, nonetheless, but the Royal Canadian Mounted Police came to the lake to check it out anyway. When the police arrived, the presumed car did not appear so clearly. 
so the police asked Max to dive into the lake with his GoPro to see what he could find. Lo and behold, the car was still there, in full, and there was a human body in the driver's seat. It quickly became apparent that the car wasn't the one in the 2007 rescue, but one that had been at the bottom of the lake for potentially some time. The police divers team arrived a few days later and confirmed the body in the car. Analysis revealed that the body was that of Janet Farris, who had disappeared on her way to a wedding in the Griffin Lake area. Police were quick to rule out foul play and rather concluded that it was likely Janet swerved, trying to avoid an animal or something else and lost control, spinning into the lake. Though the truth will never be fully known, for Janet's family, however, a welcome comfort to finally knowing where their relative was all this time. The Pensioner Who Vanished James Pruitt, a 70-year-old resident of the sunny state of Tennessee, was reported missing from the Rocky Mountain National Park in early March 2019. Alarm bells were first raised when his car was found desolate at the Glacier George Trailhead on the early morning of March 3rd. Upon further investigation, rangers uncovered that Pruitt had not been in contact with his family for several days before his disappearance, since February 28th as a matter of fact. Naturally, this confirmed the rangers' suspicions and search efforts got underway swiftly later that day. However, as always seems to happen in these situations, the odds were against the search party from the off. The park had been smothered in two feet of snow just days before Pruitt's disappearance was reported, and coupled with the rocky terrain, it was becoming evident that finding Pruitt was going to be no easy feat. For six days, between March 3rd and March 8th, an extensive search was conducted. Rangers trawled the park and a variety of specialized teams were also deployed utilizing dogs and even aerial reconnaissance. The search encompassed 15 square miles of lakes, glaciers and gorges, yet James Pruitt was still nowhere to be found. Owing to the persistent bad weather, search efforts were called off in mid-March, although the story does not just end here. During the summer, efforts were revitalized and focused on more specific areas, and there was also more hope this time as the summer was a busy time with over two million people flocking to the park each year to bask in its secluded beauty. This meant that with streams of visitors also traversing the park, it was much more likely that someone was going to stumble on a clue, perhaps one of his belongings or even Pruitt himself. But unfortunately, the series of attempts that took place over the summer yielded no clues nor results and efforts tapered off. At this point, you would be forgiven for thinking that any chance of Pruitt being found were long gone. However, in October, a new search began, albeit with a different tactic. Instead of focused searches in popular parts of the park, efforts were concentrated in off-trail areas. It was hoped that, as visitors were less common there, clues linked to Pruitt could still be awaiting discovery, and any tracks he may have left could still be intact. Ultimately, the search was unsuccessful, but it demonstrated the resilience of the search teams. In a final blow to any hopes of finding Pruitt alive, the park's public information officer, Kyle Patterson, confirmed that no active searches would be taking place as of the 26th of November 2019, instead relying on members of the public to report anything they think might be relevant. As of 2021, Mr. Pruitt is still considered missing with the occasional Facebook post reminding the public to keep their eyes peeled for clues. With that said, any hope of uncovering the truth of his untimely demise has long been extinguished. The McCullough Disappearance Charles McCullough was 19 in 1974 when he left his home state of Virginia to travel to Oregon for a hiking adventure. Charles, or Chuck as he was affectionately known, had seen some friends before planning a trip to Crater Lake National Park in Oregon for a few days of walking amongst the stunning snowy mountains, beautiful sunsets and sunrises, and the crystal blue waters of the lake itself. Charles was a keen photographer, and despite weather conditions in the park tending to be poor in January, the month of his trip, Charles ventured on alone into the wilderness. 
Crater Lake National Park is covered in deep snow during the winter months. The park is still open and visitors can take guided snowshoe tours and even ski in the mountains. However, the conditions can be extreme and traveling alone is not recommended. Not to mention that Crater Lake is actually the deepest lake in America at a massive 594 meters deep at its deepest point. Charles told his friends that he would be gone for around two days before returning to their house for the remainder of his trip. However, he did tell them that, if he was not back by the 1st of February, to call the police and report him missing. This would turn out to be a valuable piece of information. The days passed and the 1st of February was drawing nearer with no sign of Charles returning. The day swiftly came and his friends began to worry, calling the police and reporting him missing. The authorities powered through the worsening conditions, but to no avail. A mass search team found no evidence of Charles, with some assuming that he had changed his direction and that they might be looking in the wrong place. However, with nearly two and a half meters of snow, the search was not getting any easier, and despite the park thawing out as spring drew near, neither Charles nor his body were anywhere to be seen. There had been reports of people spotting Charles in the Diamond Lake area, a 45-minute car ride from Crater Lake, and a park ranger reported that he had given Charles a lift to the entrance of the National Park on the 30th of January. What had happened after he dropped Charles off, however, the ranger did not know. Nearly a year-long search showed nothing, until in 1976, two friends from Texas stumbled across chilling human remains after taking a wrong turn on their hike. The remains were confirmed to be those of Charles, but they were scattered strangely, with a lot of the bones still inside Charles's clothes. The weirdest thing, however, was that the remains were found 12 miles from where the park ranger had dropped Charles off on the 30th of January. How had he travelled so far in such awful conditions? The skull that was recovered showed no blunt trauma, and investigators concluded that Charles had frozen to death after removing his clothes in what scientists call paradoxical undressing, feeling hot when you are freezing cold. Charles's family did not accept the explanation, and were sure that foul play had occurred somewhere along the line. After all, why were the remains in such a secluded place? Charles's brother wrote in 2016, If only those broken-off shin bones could have talked to us. What do you think they'd say? I bet they'd say something like this. I hitched a ride with this creepy guy who stole my camera equipment and money and shot me in the head. Then, on a clear day in the dead of winter, he hauled my body into the remotest part of Crater Lake, took my shirt and boots off, and set me up on a log and left, figuring the animals would destroy the evidence by spring. Haunting, tragic, indeed, and still utterly bizarre. We will never know what happened to Janet Ferris, James Pruitt, or Charles McCullough. The Disappearance of Keith Reinhard The tiny village of Silver Plume in Colorado has a population of just over 200. It was the location solitude that enticed Keith Reinhardt in 1988 to take a three-month sabbatical from his job as a sports writer, leave his wife and family and get some much-needed respite and work on his novel. Reinhardt also saw the tiny village, which boasted mountainous areas, as an opportunity to overcome his lifelong fear of heights and get in better shape. When he arrived in Silver Plume, he leased a small shop to sell antiques and photographs to maintain him financially. It was then that Reinhard learned about the previous owner of the shop, a man called Tom Young, who on July 31st of the previous year went for a walk with his dog and never returned. A month into Reinhard's stay at Silver Plume, the bodies of Young and his dog were found propped against a tree in the wilderness. Both had been shot dead. Since Young had purchased a gun several days before he disappeared, the police ruled that Young had shot his dog and then committed suicide. However, Local villagers who had known Young disputed the conclusion that Young would ever hurt his beloved dog. Rumours started to float around that something more sinister had occurred to Young. Reinhard was taken by the case and the similarities between himself and Young. Not only had they both at one point owned the same store, but if Young had killed himself, then both were going through troubled times. 
he decided to base the main character in his novel on an amalgamation of Jung and himself called Guy Gypsum. Reinhard's daughter, Tiffany, said that her father struggled to separate fact from fiction, and this possibly explains what happened next. One week after Jung's body was found, Reinhard set off to climb to the top of the nearby Pendleton Mountain. Climbing the mountain was a six-hour hike, and Reinhard had set off in the late afternoon, meaning he would be walking through the tough rocky terrain at night which was known to be inhabited by wild animals. This was particularly alarming given Reinhard's lack of experience climbing mountains and his prior fear of heights. Reinhard did not return that night, and the next day over 100 men equipped with trained dogs and helicopters began to search the site for him. The search became one of the biggest in Colorado history, and was only called off when a plane involved in the search crashed, killing one and injuring another. Reinhard was never found. Following his disappearance, people began to question what had happened to Reinhard. There were two main theories. The first theory was that Reinhard had been attempting to mimic what had happened to Jung. In the last page of his novel manuscript, he had written about how the main character was setting off to walk towards the lush, shadowless Colorado forest above. Reinhard might have been trying to live the events of the character before writing it down. Some even believe that Reinhard is still alive, but after learning about the crashed plane that had been searching for him, decided to flee. In fact, there have been multiple reports of sightings of Reinhard in countries like Mexico since his disappearance. The second theory is that Reinhard was a victim of foul play. Reinhard's own son Kai supports this theory. He believes that Jung was harmed by somebody and Reinhard suffered the same fate. He suspects that the shop that both men had owned might have put them at risk. Others argue that if Jung had been killed, the person who killed him would view Reinhard and his interest in Jung as a threat, so would want to cause him harm. The Disappearance of Jared Negret Jared Negret was a 13-year-old Boy Scout who has not been seen since July 19, 1991, when he was separated from his troop of climbers in the San Bernardino National Forest. Tragically, the expedition was Negret's first overnight backpacking trip with the Boy Scouts. As an inexperienced climber, and described as being slightly overweight, climbing to the summit of the 11,500-foot mountain was a tough task. Negret grew tired at about 1,000 feet from the top and was told to remain behind while the others completed the hike. However, when the troop returned, Negret was nowhere to be seen. The troop leader immediately led the five other scouts back to the base camp and then hiked about five miles in the dark to get help. A massive search was launched, consisting of San Bernardino County Sheriff's deputies and rescue teams from as far away as Sierra Madre and San Damas. They searched the 130 square mile area of San Gorgonio Wilderness and on the third day focused their search on a six square mile area where one of Negret's footprints was discovered. In this area, searchers also uncovered beef jerky and candy wrappers they believed to have belonged to Negret. The most interesting discovery, though, was Negret's camera. On the camera, there were 12 snapshots. All but one were landscape shots. However, the final image was a close-up self-portrait of Jared, showing only his nose and eyes. The photograph had been taken using flash photography, and Negret appeared terrified in the image. Some have even claimed to see a pair of eyes behind Negret, as if he was using the camera to scare off a threat. It is believed that Negret lost his life by succumbing to the elements or by suffering a fall down the mountain. But over 30 years later, there are no traces of remains of the boy and Negret's final moments remain unanswered. Jacobo Grinberg The last case we'll be talking about is that of Jacobo Grinberg, a Mexican neurophysiologist and psychologist who went missing in December 1994. Dr. Jacobo Grinberg was an academic interested in shamanism, meditation, astrology, and telepathy, among other subjects. He wrote over 50 books on various topics. He was most interested in the relationship between what appeared to be spirituality and science, researching about how the scientific method could be used for telepathy. This work was often rejected by his colleagues, as it edged too close to magic to have anything to do with science. 
He was a spiritual man who was determined to connect these beliefs with science, studying brain waves and experimenting with connections between mysticism and neurophysiology. On December 8, 1994, Dr. Grinberg went missing. He had a birthday party planned for the 12th that he did not show up to. But this was not odd to his family because he had a habit of disappearing without contact for days at a time. Many theories and conspiracies have circulated about where he went and why he left, and indeed, how he disappeared. There was only one that was debunked without a doubt. His family did not believe it was possible for him to have voluntarily abandoned both his work and his daughter. The strangest theory that remains surrounding this case is that of Jacobo's wife, Ter. The day after he disappeared, she cashed a check for $1,000 at a bank and dismissed the watchman at their country house. She told his stepmother that he had left for Campeche and that they would be leaving to Nepal when he returned. Making arrangements, Ter left too, but disappearing completely and having little contact with her family outside of a few calls and that year to her mother. When her family was contacted about the missing case, they claimed to have not even known that she had been married at all. This all led to Grinberg's family believing that she must have attacked him and left, perhaps not alone, but with help. However, there was never any proof of this because evidence was never found. Investigators and officers did not find blood, trails, or a body to give them any idea of what might have happened. Although the world can seem like a dangerous place, one can take comfort in the thought that cases such as these stand out because they are unusual and not common. But what do you make of these disappearances and the stories behind them? Be sure to let us know your thoughts in the comment section below and help us by growing this community while working to solve these unexplained mysteries. Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe for more videos.